And welcome you back to Dharma Discussion in English, organized by the Council of Thai Buddhist Mung of the United Kingdom and Ireland. And my name is Pramana Pasakon Bio Paso, the General Secretary, Secretary of the Council of Thai Buddhist Mung in the UK. And again, today we have the guest and also the co-host. But before we start the Dharma discussion, I just would like to invite Tanajan Jokun Lao or Parat Vithet Panyakun, and who's the Vice Chairman of the Council of Thai Buddhist Mung of the UK and Ireland to welcome the audience and also to open the discussion. And together with me is Tan Pramaha Sena, uh, Surat Seno, and he's from Oxford Buddhist Vihara. And as you may see that he often organized the online activity and on daily basis. So he will be my co-host. So Ajahn Jakun Lao, and if you are ready, could you please welcome the audience to our program? Thank you. Venerable friends in the Dhamma. And today, the evening on 22nd August. I'm pleased that we have a special discussion and we have two guests. One, the most venerable Tanjakun Pavanavite or Jan Kematamo from Warwick Temple. And today we have also Tan Mahasena to be to guest for our council uh, of the Thai Buddhist monk in UK. Thank you, Tan Maha Sena. While we are waiting for the other speakers, I would like to talk briefly about the project or the program that we are running now. Uh, when we uh, talk about work of Buddhist monks in England. We have the Council of the Thai Monks, and we mentioned to our members that when we have the, uh, the day with uh, COVID-19, uh, the, the, the virus, which is very serious uh, disease, which is we really concern uh, very much that we have to lock down our temple, lock down the system, everything. We have difficulty to talk to our members or to welcome anybody to the temple. That is suffer enough for the monks. We don't have someone to support. And also the Thai people or English people who like to come to the temple also suffer because they won't be able to come to the temple as normal. When we have these problems, we recognize the social concern, how we are going to do and deal with the people in society. Then the Council of the Thai monks in the UK or United Kingdom and Ireland uh, have the meeting and introduce the program. Our program that we would like to talk in two languages, Thai and in English. So English as well, uh, in the one once once a month in Thai and once a month in English, so it's the first week in Thai language and the third week in Thai uh, in English. You see today, last time I've been uh, uh, invited and by the the council that we should be able to open our work or our uh, views to talk about. Uh, the new uh, system that we talk to the people and then we give a Dhamma talk to the people. And now a lot of activities going on now. It's really, really good. I'm pleased that Tan Mahasena who have been here and also uh, you, he's here today and he organized quite a number of activities about, about the, the work of the, the monks different areas. The Council of the Thai Monks in UK, we have 
about 24 thumb temples now, and we have the meeting monthly. So also this is very good. This year we won't be able to have the meeting at the temple as annual meeting or the conference or seminar, whatever we have done in the past. But this year we have to cancel all of these meeting. But we have the annual, uh, we have the monthly meeting instead. So everybody have to uh, talk about our uh, the, the, the the issue what we have, which is more uh, more convenient. So it's going to be new normal for us in the future. I have no idea when it's going to be end until we know the vaccine to uh, protect ourselves or to support or to cure this disease. But so far, this is very uh, serious that we we have to 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 deal with that. The the council of the Thai monks in UK now we do our work. So now I would like to uh, uh, to stop talking and then to pay respect to Ajahn Long Pho Kema Thammo. And I would like to uh, invite Ajahn Kema Thammo or Jokun Pha Pawana Vitek and welcome him to uh, discussion for today. After this is the our council work that we would like to invite monks from different uh, temple and also uh, from different uh, tradition maybe in the future to have Tama discussion. We sit led by Tanmaha Pasakon Piyopaso, the secretary of the council. And I'm pleased and Paul, who you are here today. May I say briefly about Long Paul? Because Long Paul is, uh, uh, since I came to England, I know Long Paul. And we visit him, it was 1987, the first time I visit his temple in, uh, in, in Warwick Temple at the time. I was very young then, 27 years old. <laughs> and then when then I visit uh, Ajahn Long Paul Temple and then we uh, chant, one thing is very, very interesting because Thai monks when we chant, we, I myself cannot re remember Tamajaka by heart. And I don't know why we chant Tamajaka that day, but after whoever chant Tamajaka, and then none of the monks can chant. And thanks, thanks goodness, and thanks, hope, thankfully, <laughs> that the lay Burmese can continue the chanting <laughs> and back up the monk. <laughs> it's very nice. Anyhow, Ajahn, it's very good that you are here today. And what I like to tell the people about, uh, about you briefly, because San Mahapasakon would ask you, uh, I know that you've been the, uh, uh, the people who is involved with the uh, Thai and the English tradition know Ajahn very well that he is Ajahn Long Paul Kematambo. We call him Kematambo. So his temple is a Warwick not far from Birmingham. And the temple name at the time in Thai language, maybe at the moment still, it was Santi. Uh, Santi, uh, Santi Tham, what part? Santi Tham. That his temple name and the uh, forest hermitage temple uh, in junction uh, 15 in uh, M M40. So he's working for uh, Thai uh, and also he for the Buddhist uh, for many years. What I understand that he is now one of the most senior monk in UK and he's Chao Kun and he very um, uh, been recognized by the British. Uh, society or English or royal that we uh, call him Long Ho, he got OBE. So I don't know what OBE stands for, but when the monk in Thailand asked me what the OBE stands for, I, I said, I don't know at the time. So Jokun in Thailand asked me, and who is he? And then why he got this? And then we must do something for him. We must give him the title at the time. We discussed about that. And it's very good that he is now today. I know him briefly about it, but Mahapasakon can talk to him and ask him question. Okay, Pasakon, I let you do it. Okay, thank you to Tanajan Jukun Lao for a very brief introduction to Lung Po Kematamo or Pa Pawana Vite. I would like to invite Tan Pramaswe not to say a few words to the audience and also to say greeting to Lung Po. 
that please unveil yourself. Yeah, okay, we can hear you now. Uh, may I, first of all, uh, pay my uh, humble respect to Tanajan Chagun Tan Long Po, Kematamo, and my, uh, I pay respect also to Tanajan Tan Chagun Lao and Tanajan Prama Pasakon, uh, the host today, today. And I'm very thankful that Tanajan uh, Prama Pasakon that uh, give me this opportunity to join you this, um, this Zoom talk today, which is very, uh, very good and very uh, useful program. And I also want to greet to everyone for all our audience here today that uh, you, you are here and join us and uh, to listen to the, you know, to the experience and to the talk of Long Pao Kema Tamo. And uh, yes, after this, we're going to uh, hear, we're going to listen, we're going to learn about the Long Pao uh, life and as the Western monk and uh, as he's been in the monkhood for a long time and he's going to share with us here today and uh, yes this is for the beginning yeah I'm just saying this word. okay thank you to Tam um well it will be a, a form of discussion um so the guest speaker will be Long Pa Kim um perhaps I would like to invite Lung Po to say greeting to the audience and then we can start with a few questions about your background before you became interested in Buddhism and back in 19, I think in 1970 something. Yeah, I remember that you was ordained as a novice monk at Van Mahathat and then you went on to receive a high ordination in 1972, yeah, something. Yes, 1972 at Wat Warin Ram in Ubon Rajatani province. Uh, Lopo, may I invite you to say a few words to greet the audience? Yeah, please unmute yourself. Yeah, we can hear you now. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to take part tonight and uh, I'm uh, pleased to be speaking to I guess a worldwide audience so that's very nice and uh, yes I, I should be happy to tell you a little bit about uh, Buddhism in the old days in, in England. Right thank you there's just a short um, introduction. Well let's talk about your background and before you came across Buddhism. Um, as I could recall, you once mentioned that you came to learn Buddhism and meditation at the own Buddha Patipa Temple in Ichin. And um, Buddha Patipa Temple was established in 1966 in Ichin. Um, I just would like you to share your experience of meeting Buddhism in the Western country and during that time, what was like Buddhism? Well, it was, it was very different because I, uh, I often say to Thai people how uh, fortunate you are to have grown up in a Buddhist country. I, I knew nothing about Buddhism. I didn't even know who the Buddha was until I was 22. Uh, I was 22 in 1966. And uh, in 1966, the day after my 22nd birthday, I, I joined the National Theatre Company. I was a, an actor. And sometime between then and the end of the year, I uh, took an interest in Buddhism, mostly out of curiosity. And I, I started actually at the old Hampstead Buddhist Vihara on Haverstock Hill. When I was a student, I lived on Haverstock Hill, and I lived in that area from, from well, for several years. Uh, and uh, so that was the, the obvious place for me to go to. And at the time, it was in chaos there. Uh, 
and then a little while later Kapilawadu came back, he who had founded it. Um, and there was a Thai monk called uh, Bunjoy Ketuta. Uh, I, I saw the video of uh, last month and the picture uh, that was put up with the news about Mahavichit was not Mahavichit, that was Mahabunjoy. Okay, yeah, it was uh, my mistake. This. Yeah, yeah, I, I knew him quite well. Yeah. And, uh, and so he um, then on New Year's Day, 1967, he and Kapilawadu, who'd recently reordained, uh, went across to Wat Puttapati, to East Sheen. And I went with them. I went in the in the taxi with them. Mm -hmm. So that was my first uh, visit to to Wat Puta Patip, New Year's Day, nineteen sixty seven. Yeah, nineteen sixty seven. It's one year after yeah, after the establishment of the after the, the opening ceremony of the Buddha Patipa Temple because the Buddha Patipa Temple was. Opened on the 1st of August 1966, and the opening ceremony was presided over by His Less Majesty King Ramon the Nine and his Queen. And well, now Tan Sena, and would you like to put question to Long Pa? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Long Pa, for your you know uh, sharing with us about your you know your, your experience and uh, in the you know long times ago. I learned that you, Long Pao, you returned to the UK before even, you know, in, on, on the, you know, the year that I, I was born. It was uh, 1977, isn't it, Long Pao, when you, uh, you returned to the UK? Uh, and yeah, my question now is that, but, hello? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay now, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, my uh, question is that, Long Pao, uh, please uh, kindly, Share with us about your your life as a Western monk, as a Western Buddhist monk. You know, perhaps you can also share about your impressions of like uh, Long Po Sha, and you know, as as everybody knows about, you know, as oh, Long Po Sha. Yes, even the atmosphere of Buddhism in Thailand in early days when you were studying under the guidance of Long Po Sha. Yes. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll just go back a little bit because I, um, after I first went to Wat Puta Patip, then later on, that's where I used to go mostly. And uh, there was a monk from, well, he had some association with Ubon, who was staying at Wat Puta Patip then. And it was he who suggested I go to see Long Po Cha. Long Po Cha wasn't, wasn't well known in those days. So I, uh, I continued practicing at Wat Patip, and I did a retreat uh, in a retreat center owned by the English Sangha Trust. Uh, and after that, I felt that the only good thing to do with my life would be to, to uh, be a Buddhist monk. But I couldn't do that immediately because I was under contract. And uh, so it was a little while, a few years after before I was able to, to break away and go to Thailand. Uh, when I arrived in Thailand, I, I, um, I ended up in Wat Mahatha and uh, I took novice ordination with uh, Chakun Tep Siti Muni. He was Chakun Tep Siti Muni then. And, uh, and then soon after that, I met an old friend of mine in Bangkok who had already ordained and was already at uh, what uh, at, at what um, uh, Pa Pong, and uh, he said to me, he said, "If you want to be a real monk, he said, there's the only the only place to go is what Pa Pong." So what can I do? <laughs> so I uh, I uh, went on the first of January, 1972, uh, to Ubon with that Thai monk who by this time had come back to Thailand and was briefly uh, staying um, in the Ubon area. Uh, he, was, he was researching for his degree in England. So he asked me to accompany him and, uh, and help him with his English. So I did that 
and then I was taken to Wat Ba Pong and I joined Wat Ba Pong sometime I suppose I can't remember the date sometime in January 1972 as a summer name still a summer name. Uh, sorry Lung Po for how long have you been staying at Wat Ba Pong for many years? Oh I, well I went to Wat Ba Pong in 1971, or 72 rather, and then I came back to England with Long Po Cha in 1977. Yes. But I stayed, I stayed mostly in various Saka, various branches of, of, of Wat Pa Pong. Okay, thank you. Ajaja mm. Kula, do you, do you have any questions for Long Po? Yeah, please unmute yourself. Long Po, because I uh, know that you've been involved with the uh, temple. You said Edward Mahathat as well. Yeah, you yeah. become a novice there, did you? Or, uh, how, how many years you've been a novice, and how old were you at the time? You been a oh, I was I was twenty seven. Oh, twenty seven. And how many how many years a novice, Tom Paul? Oh, just uh, five months. So then, I, I was yeah. I, I became a novice. I, in uh, December 1971, and then I went to Ubon, I went to uh, Wat Ba Pong, and uh, I stayed at one of the Saka at um, Wat Tam Sang Pet for a while. And then Lung Po Cha came and collected me just before uh, Wizaka Puja uh, to prepare me to take uh, Upasampada. So there were a group of us about, I can't remember, 18 or 20 um, went to receive Upasampada. Uh, I'm the only one left. <laughs> All wow. the others either died oh. or <laughs> they died or they 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 uh, <clears throat> disrobe. Yeah. <laughs> they died or did they disrobe? And Ajahn Lao asked you the question. Yeah, they either died or disrobed. Okay. They <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have long life. <laughs> long for us, may, 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 I, may I have um, one question? Um, as we know well, you know, as a Long Po Cha tradition, everywhere, even here, uh, before you become a monk or even a novice monk, you need to, or you have to uh, uh, become a, you know, chi pa or a you know, white cloth for for a few years, for at, at least two years. No, do no, you have no. to, did you have to, to do that long part before you become a novice then? No, 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 that, that, um, that wasn't uh, happening back then. Right. Um, long Po Cha, uh, I mean, I was, I was already a name, a novice from, uh, from Wat Mahatat. And if anyone arrived at Wat Pa Pong and they were already novice or already bhikkhu, then th that, that remained, but he would, just usually um, uh, keep people some time before he accepted them, that's all. But in my case, uh, he just um, accepted me five months, I was a novice. He, um, um, he, it was only later that he, he, um, he was trying to <clears throat> bring in one year as a pakao, one year as a novice, then yeah. five years, you had to summer time, five years as bhikkhu with him. So, yeah. and I remember him saying to me, one day um, in my second second year, uh, when I was staying at Wat Kern, uh, and he used to come there for um, for a rest, and uh, we were sweeping, and he, I remember him coming up to me and telling me, he said that he he hoped to make it one year for Pakal, one year for summer name, one year for, and then five years as 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 Prat. That was his his ambition, but he hadn't uh, got that started at that point. Did he say any reason why you need to do the Chipaka for one year, for example? Well, it, it was mostly because, you know, if you, as soon as you take robes in Thailand, then your status goes up a bit. Yes. And uh, so I think he was concerned to sort of combat that pride that might arise in mm. some people's minds. Yes. Uh, but also to make it clear that when you ordain, with him, then you are in training, and uh, and to get that kind of uh, sense in in your mind before going any further. And also, of course, 
it gave you an opportunity to get used to to yeah. uh, being a renunciate Wonderful and to start to learning start start to learn some of the uh, the regulations and the core work and one thing and another. Mm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Asha Lumpur, how, how did you manage Thai food during that day? And Thai you food? To eat sticky food, uh, sticky rice? <laughs> Especially Isan food, isn't it? Or Isan food. Well, st sticky rice was no sticky problem. Rice. I've always liked sticky rice. That was no problem. But I must say the rest um, was, uh, was difficult. I mean, I didn't, I didn't suffer from indigestion and I ate it. Um, I didn't know, I never knew what I was eating, but I used to eat it. But the trouble was in the first six months, my body didn't seem to realize this was food I was putting in. <laughs> and, and I got incredibly thin and run down and I kept being ill. And I had, a, I had an accident one morning on, on Bindapart and smashed my, the nail off of one of my toes. And I, it was pretty grim really the first few months. And then for my first pantsa, um, I went to Pudindang in uh, uh, Sisuke. Uh, uh, it's a Saka Wat Bapong. And the food there is, it's not, it's not luxurious, but it's very nutritious, uh, mm. and every day. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I recovered my health. <laughs> no problem. May I, may I ask another a little things? But you know, um, as I've heard or listened from the many talk of like a um, you know, disciple or followers like um, Ajahn, you know, Sumeto and yourself, Ajahn Maro. You when you when, when they talk about their their life when they when they first you know uh, begin their life at the monastic life at the forest temple, they have uh, they suffered from you know mosquitoes, from the work and other stuff uh, you know routine at the temple. They 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 they, they, they were shocked about it a bit, but later they you know family with that. What about yourself, Lompo? Do you have? Any kind of this experience shock yourself, you know, when when you were first at you know, the forest temple in the forest. I, I didn't. I, for I, I I didn't worry too much about any of that. I'd been in India before I went to well, all right okay. Thailand, um, and I'd been roughing it quite a bit in India. So I I wasn't too worried, although I was a bit. Um, I I discovered I wasn't as strong as I had been, because. When you're living in India for a while, you get pretty run down, and that was that was the, my my case. My problem, my first problem, uh, with Wat Pa Pong, was you see, when I was I'd, I'd been an actor and I trained uh, properly as an actor. I was at the Royal Central School and then at uh, uh, Drama Centre. I was a founding student at Drama Centre, and then uh, uh, seven years as an actor and three years at the Royal National, and uh, and. In those days, the, the tradition that was growing was one of being anti the star system and pro company. And I was very pro company. I, I, although I'd worked with big stars, I mean, in the National Theatre was Laurence Olivier and all sorts of well known people, but, um, but it was still the company that was important. And then I get to Ubon and I get to Wat Pa Pong, and everywhere I look, there's pictures of Lung Po Cha mm -hmm. uh, in the sala, uh, in several of them, uh, everywhere. And I, wherever I went in Ubon shops and places, there's pictures of Lung Po Cha. And it was like I'd suddenly been drafted back into the into the star system, which I I really disapproved of, and uh, and I really had difficulty with that. I didn't like it. I have to confess. To begin with, I it just seemed kind of wrong to me. And, and, and it certainly was nothing like what I expected. And the devotion to Lung Po Cha, also from some of the Farang who were already there, I, Americans, I, I couldn't, I'm not, I'm not a devotional type. Um, and I, I couldn't stomach it really. I, and, and of course, I couldn't understand to begin with what was so special about Lung Po Cha? Everyone's sort of saying he's very special, but I couldn't see it. 
for a long time. Uh, so it was a gradual, a gradual process with me, but I had to deal with that resistance to begin with. And that was, that was the biggest difficulty, I think, to begin with. Mm. And it wasn't, the Frank were not sympathetic to me at all. They didn't like it that I was questioning the, you know, what was, what was special about Rumpo Chan. And the Americans didn't like it. <laughs> Rumpo, uh, some already disrobed, but do you, do you have uh, uh, any, uh, any time that you feel you want to, sorry for about this is a question of, uh, um, you, will, you feel that you want to uh, give up your monkhood or disrobe, Rumpo? Do you have any at all? Sorry for that, I'm not sure. Well, of course, I think, I think most, most uh, monks will feel that sometimes. And uh, there were, but, but it never got very far because I, I've always been a bit scared of that. Because you see, right from the beginning, I, I felt that the very, the very best thing you could be doing would be to be a Buddhist monk. And the very highest thing would be mm -hmm. to, to attain ni ni nirvana. nirvana yes. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's, it's just not possible to give up. You, you, and I'm not the giving up type, you know, which annoys some people, but uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't give, give up easily. I, 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 I mean, agree with I, Lung Pa. I, um, yeah, I agree with Lung Pa because I, I believe that all the monks have this thought. And hmm. at a certain time, even I myself consider to disrobe when I wasn't happy with something, with the administration, and then I feel tired. But this feeling didn't last long. And later on, I could find something good about being a monk. And often the school children ask me, I, why, why don't you want to get married? Why don't you have a family? I said, well, as a Buddhist monk, we have more time for the community. We have more time for other people. And at the same time, you train yourself. So I love being a monk because I have a chance to help other people. And at the same time, I feel that I have freedom. What kind of freedom? Because I have no family to worry about. I have no uh, wife or children to look after. So this is from my, from my experience. And now, Tanajan Jekunda, would you like to put question to Lung Pa? Well, thank you, Hana Vatikon. Lung Pa, after you've been many, many years in England, I would like to ask first that when did you interest in a, being vegetarian? You were vegetarian before or just, <laughs> and what did make you, and then how you deal with that? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> because I know that you are temple vegetarian yeah, yourself. And secondly, if you can tell us a little bit about your journey to England, where you first start before you are here in Warwick. That is something that we interest to know about that. Well, vegetarian, I was, I was sometimes vegetarian before I went to Thailand. Not, not all the time, but sometimes. Uh, and, and I'm vegetarian because I love animals. And I can't bear, really, the idea of killing creatures to eat them. I think it's, to be honest, I think it, there's something really obscene about it. Um, and of course, nowadays, it's a horrible industry, dreadful industry and dreadful cruelty to, to, to animals. Um, and, and so I, I, uh, I, feel, I feel quite strongly about it. And also, of course, you, are, you must realize that a lot of English people are really shocked when they see Buddhist monks eating meat, um, and they don't understand it at all. They feel that you know that that uh, uh, it shouldn't be that way, and and they can't kind of put it together when you say you know we give precepts panati pata, and then you know tuck into a, a, a juicy steak or something. It doesn't um, it doesn't uh, go down very well. I I don't do it. I don't. I'm not vegetarian. For that reason, I, actually, but I am, I am certainly very uh, sympathetic to to animals, and I don't like, I, I just don't like the. Uh, yeah, and look, I have one experience, and I still remember the day, and we stopped at welcome break, and then when we were about to leave the service, 
I remember we met one old English lady who put the question to all the monks. And she asked all the monks, did you eat meat? So all the monks would say, yes, we do eat meat. And then she um, banished the monk. She said, oh, and you can't simply do that because imagine if you have the small dog and then one day you call your dog and say, well, you're my friend, but another day you kill your dog and eat and eat it. And that is incorrect. Well, when I, when I heard her question, I said, well, I actually eat food, although, although we, eat, we eat meat, but as a Buddhist monk, of course, we can't, we can't say we want this, we want that. But if, if you have a chance or if someone prepare a vegetarian food for you, that would be good. But in, in real life, if you can't choose your food, that would be a bit difficult. So I prefer to say I eat, I eat food rather than animal or, or of, uh, vegetable. And, and can, I add a, can I add a little bit about this? Yeah, I, once my experience at the um, Hajula Rungkong Racha Priyalai, we have a conference, you know, we, we separate different room for the uh, vegetarians and non-vegetarian, you know, people to queue in line. In the vegetarian one, there are, there are people and Western people, you know, the lay people. And the non-vegetarian one, only a monk in, standing in queue for that. And this is what I should <laughs> It's very interesting. This, this question, Long you know why? Because <laughs> we are facing difficulty to answer this question. And as Mahapasakon mentioned that, uh, when you eat, and then we have to say we eat food. And they said, if you eat animal, it seems you, you said we not kill. And then they said, even though you not kill, you're more or less uh, back up or support those who kill for you. Otherwise, uh, they won't be able to kill. Mm -hmm. If you, I agree in this point. This uh, this is uh, agree uh, the argument. However, I went to to visit uh, Taiwan uh, for the first week uh, about about seven days and eight days there. I I understand that most of the Chinese they they are vegetarian. I came back. I almost turned my temple to be vegetarian. Because I like food, that, but however, my monks look at me. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's about vegetarians. We can talk one topic for this. Yeah, okay. um, then, then we have, you know, the, the, the question from our listener. No, Paul. Can I, can uh, I? Can I can are, are you allowed to? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. And we can, we can take the question from the, from the Yes, book. one question only, you know, uh, you, Came, uh, went back to when when Long Po, you know, saw the the pictures of uh, Long Po Cha, you know, you you feel emptied about seeing the the photos of Long Po Cha, you know, in, in at the beginning. So, what in Long Po Cha that make you <coughs> accept it in Long Po Cha later, Long Po? Is that? Um, well, first of all, what I did I did what was very clear to me was that the setup. Uh, was was good. Uh, so it was Wat Ba Pong was set up in a very sort of logical way. So you could practice meditation, you could practice mindfulness and so on. And, uh, and I also liked his attitude to Prat Winai because um, he gave it a meaning and he, he made it a practice and it, made, it was it became an important sort of tool uh, with which you could uh, develop your, your your life, so that that I liked. It was, there was a certain kind of simplicity to it. I mean, especially for the Farang, because we had no books um, in English. We had all we had. We had a translation of of Winayamuk, Winayamuk Volume One. That was it for our source of of, of written Winya, and. Uh, and so it was simple and and effective. So that all that I I was happy with. Um, and then gradually, as I watched Lung Po Cha, he sort of grew on me. And I saw there someone who was, uh, a, you know, quite strict, and he could certainly be quite tough. I mean, the image many people have of him is of this very sort of genial 
elderly man, always smiling and so on. But that, that was one side of him. There was also another side. And uh, he could be quite um, pretty tough. And he was once or twice quite hard on me. Um, but, you know, I can take these things. So that was all right. I was used to, as, a, as an actor, I was used to a disciplined life. And I was used to criticism, so. <laughs> okay, yeah. Right, so now we move to the, um, the third point. And because then you came back to the UK in 1977, as I remember, you start working in the prison. So you spent most of your time in the prison, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> I, I remember you, you, you said that at one of our conference, you said that since you came back to the UK and then you spent most of, most of your life in the prison, could you please tell us about your experience with the um, prisoner and what, what are you doing in the prison? Yes, I, I, when I, 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 I came to, to England with Lung Po Chan, we came to the Hampstead Buddhist Vihara, which is where I'd, I'd started out. And I already knew because Kaplawado told me um, that uh, the prison service had that address for matters Buddhist and they used to ring him up sometimes. And he told me that. And uh, so we hadn't been there very long and we had two letters, one from the chaplain on the Isle of Wight at HMP Parkhurst, a man called Hugh Searle, and then another letter from um, the chaplain at Pentonville and a phone call from the chaplain at Holloway Women's Prison. And they were all asking for someone to, uh, to visit their Buddhist prisoners. So it seemed like, you know, it was down to me really. I mean, Lung Po Cha couldn't go. Uh, so I, I, uh, I decided I could, I could have a go. Um, and I asked him, I was on a train with Lumpo Cha one day, so I thought I'd better ask his permission. So I asked him what he thought about my uh, going to the prisons. And so far as I can remember, he simply said, bye. Go. And, uh, and so that was it, really. I mean, he was always very encouraging of us to do things and to, uh, you know, give Tamadesa and all, all sorts of things. So... So it was, it didn't really surprise me that much that he, he said that. So that's when I started. Um, and over the years, it's sort of evolved. It's changed quite a lot. Uh, because then um, you must understand that back then there was little else really in England, religion wise, other than Christianity. I mean, when I was young, when I was a boy, the only religions we knew about were kinds of Christianity. And I can remember at my school, great excitement when it was announced that two brothers would be joining the school who were Quakers. I mean, we were nearly at the windows to see these Quakers. Um, and we knew nothing about Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism or anything like that. This was all completely foreign territory. I didn't even I'm pretty sure I never saw a black man until I was about 18. Um, so it was a very, very different country back then. And even in 1977, it was pretty different from what it is now. Um, so they had no facility for really uh, in law for anyone but Christians. So I was kind of grudgingly invited in because they had these people with an in interest in Buddhism. And I didn't know at the time that there were so many prisons in England. But of course, when I went to one prison, then I discovered that after a while, prisoners were being transferred to other prisons. And then they expected me to follow and go to them in the, in the new prison. So soon I was going all over the country to these different jails. Um, and in the beginning, in those early days, simply talking to prisoners. So I would, it was nearly all one-to-one. -one. I would have conversations with them in their cells. And that went on for a long time until we sort of worked away at changing the system. And I was very fortunate because as you know, I, 
I became very close to Lord Avebury. And Lord Avebury was a very remarkable man, uh, very uh, dedicated to human rights. And he was a Buddhist. And uh, we became very close, he and I. And he helped me because he had a lot of influence um, as a, an hereditary peer. And, uh, and we managed eventually to change the system until we, about 20 years ago, uh, um, a multi-faith chaplaincy uh, evolved. And once that happened, then, or as that began to happen, um, then so we began to have more group practice in the prisons. So mostly up until earlier this year, when I would go into a prison, it would be to take a group. Um, so it would be group meditation. Um, the groups varied. So with some, uh, it would be mostly or all meditation. Uh, and with some, there might be some traditional practices, some chanting, but mostly, most of the guys were were interested in meditation and Buddhist teaching. Of course, I always gave a talk. Hmm. Well, Lung Po, when you visit um, the jail, um, as I understand, not only the prisoners who are Buddhists coming to listen to your talk. Is, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's optional. And if you would like to attend this talk, and to be given by a Buddhist monk, although you are not a Buddhist, but you are welcome. Um, as I understand that in the British jails, they also have the chaplains from other faith, like a Christian chaplain or um, Muslim chaplain. Um, when you give a talk to them, the prisoner, and what is the popular topic or the, the the appropriate topic that you choose for them or the right topic for those who commit committed a crime and then they end up in the prison and perhaps you can tell us more what is the most offense those prisoners committed before they if they end up in the jail well i mean you can't you can't answer that last question very easily because most i mean the guys i've been seeing over the years have committed a, a range of offences, um, murder, manslaughter, right the way down to, to, to um, minor theft. Um, some, some again and again, some guys I used to see over and over again, because what people don't realise is that when you've been in prison, it can be very, very difficult when you come out to re-establish yourself. You know, you get given a small amount of money uh, and then somehow you're expect, expected to survive. Um, and many of them just find that too much and uh, resort to crime again and come back into prison. So it's, it's a, a range of people and some, obviously some, some people are very clever, very capable uh, and, and others not so. It's, 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 uh, it's what you see in a prison really is, is it, it mirrors society in general. So you see all sorts of, 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 of people and a range of crimes. Um, in the, uh, occasionally, there's been quite an interest in karma, gamma. Um, and I do talk about that quite a bit, um, the effects of your actions. I mean, they already realize that to some extent because their actions have brought them to a point where they've, they're suffering an imprisonment. Um, and I, but mostly I talk about the Four Noble Truths. And it's sometimes said to me, I'm, I'm sometimes asked um, about how easy or difficult it may be to teach Buddhism in a prison. And I say that generally speaking, it's easier to teach Buddhism in a prison than it is outside because People in prison know about suffering. They, the, the, the Four Noble Truths are pretty easily understood. Um, whereas uh, people outside, you know, people who are comfortably off, uh, just don't get it. I remember when, when we were in, when Lung Po Cha was with us in England in 1977, 
I took him to visit my parents and uh, we went out for a drive and it was pouring with rain. So we couldn't sort of get out of the car and go anywhere particularly. So my parents insisted on stopping at, at a, 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 my, a cousin of mine's home, someone I didn't know very well, to be honest. But anyway, they were quite well off, uh, middle class people. And uh, when we arrived, it was, you know, time for afternoon tea. So there in this long lounge, this long room, at one end, they were sitting around the tea table, the, my parents and these other people, and they're all chatting away and drinking their tea and eating their bits of cake and so on. And at the other end of the room, there's Dong Po Cha and I sitting on the sofa. So after a while, Dong Po Cha nudges me in the ribs and he says, ask them if they suffer. So uh, my heart sort of sank a bit and I was just about to uh, make my excuses uh, and the room went silent. And these people at their tea, at the, at the tea party were suddenly, they, they cottoned on that Lung Po Cha had said something. So they were suddenly all silent, wanting to know what he'd said. So I, I had to, I couldn't get out of it then. I had to say, he wants to know if you suffer. It's hopeless. They're all sort of giggling. And, and in the end, I had to say to Lung Po Cha, Me Kao Jai, they don't understand. And, but you see, when, when you have things your way and you're comfortably off, you don't think about suffering. But when you've been deprived of your freedom, when you can't go home when you want to, you can't see your kid when you want to, you can't read them a story uh, when they go to bed, you can't do these things. Um, and of course you want to do it. And, and you, you feel un unhappy. So then the connection between, well, I mean, the prison is, you know, you've got a roof over your head, you've got food, it's not very nice perhaps, but you've got food, but you know, you don't want to be there. And the suffering is coming from that wanting, that desire. So it's actually not very difficult to explain to people in prison uh, the Four Noble Truths. Uh, may I have one, one question? Uh, I, I have heard that and since you start working in the prison as a um, Buddhist chaplain, and less and less ex-prisoner return to the jail. So you think this, this is um, the consequence of having meditation class or talk in the prison being taught there? Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's very important really. I know, I know sometimes now there are some sort of secular mindfulness programs going on in some of the prisons, but you need more than that, you see, really. Uh, you need Buddhism. You don't need just the, the, the secular mindfulness. You need more than that because you also need to be talking about ethics. I talk about, I talk about the precepts quite openly. I don't disguise any of that. And you know, it's a funny thing, but a lot of people who are in prison are very, they want to be very strict about that kind of thing. They don't like it. You know, I have to say this to, to Buddhist prison chaplains. I have a team of about 40 odd people uh, and I'm very insistent that they keep the five precepts strictly, including the fifth one. Um, and uh, because prisoners, you know, have an expectation. If you're going to, if you've got rules, you've got to, you should be keeping them. That's, that's their, that's their, their thinking. Um, and of course, coming back to the fifth precept, an awful lot of people are in prison for a breach of the fifth precept. I, I can't quote you exact figures now, but it's something like 60 or 70 or 70 odd percent yeah. are in prison for alcohol related crimes, mm -hmm. either because they were drunk. I mean, I've had perfectly respectable people. Um, one man in particular I can think of, um, who it was his drinking and uh, you know he ended up killing someone um, and and then others who because of drink or a drug habit or both um, needed money and uh, and got into trouble so this is the fifth precept is 
is very, very important. I hammer that home a lot and, and to people outside of prison because uh, uh, it's, it's a fine line. It's, you know, when you hear the stories of people in prison, you realize that this could happen to almost anyone, just like that. Uh, do, you, do you want to put any question? Uh, to... one, one last question, Long Po. I understand that you are uh, organizing uh, the uh, Angulimar Day. We said most of the monks are invited for uh, to, to, to perform the chanting uh, annually and in September. What about this year? Are you going to do anything like that? No, no, we can't. We can't do it this year. I'm sorry. I should have. I should have let you know. I I um I was been waiting just in case uh, it might or something might happen because as you know Spring Hill is an open prison it's a bit different it's not an enclosed sort of place I don't expect to go but I, I expect like to know what they are all going to do that is I understand that we are almost locked down again this time it's yeah. quite serious yeah so I don't expect yeah. them to be there. I I I I had a um, contact with the governor just the other day and so no we can't do anything so i'm sorry about but hopefully next year she said you know let's hope next year's better can i have small and quick question about this about um long yes. paul you know the, as you know in uh, Ankuri Mara is well known as you know the one who can you know return from the very extreme let's say bad way and then into the you know, the, same. you know the, the enlightened one. Then, when you talk about this in the prison for the scenario example for them, then uh, how is the feedback or the um, you know the, the if, if they understand about this? Because in Buddhism, you know, we as a karma, it's not fixed that you cannot change. In Buddhism, we have we can change all the time when you realize, when you just accept, and you open your mind. So. Uh, with this, uh, what is the, you know, the feedback about this, Long Paul? Well, the... Prisoners are very, are very inspired by it, because yeah. you see, when you, when mostly prisoners feel, or an awful lot of prisoners feel like they're discarded, and and condemned as, you know, there's not much hope for them, there's not much future for them, and it's true that it is very difficult. You know, if you've got a, a prison sentence, a prison record, it's very difficult to get a job and all that kind of thing. But they can often feel pretty bad. And then they, they hear about this, this man, you know, yes. I mean, the world's first great serial killer, as far as we know. I mean, uh, and, and he was redeemable and became an enlightened person. This is an amazing, you know, it's an inspiration to people. And well, I would like to invite you to talk about the background of TBS UK, um, because I know that you are the founder of TBS UK or the Theravada Buddhist Sangha in the UK. So what is your, what is the idea behind before you, you decided to found this um, um, organization? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd been thinking about it for many years. Um, what provoked me in the end was um, discovering that, well, realizing that the as, as Buddhism was growing in the West, the Sangha was being sort of um, uh, set aside rather. The, you know, as you know, many, many teachers in the West are, are lay people. And uh, I felt that the Sangha was being kind of sidelined. And I didn't think, I felt this was a danger because what I noticed was an in increasing sort of uh, number of changes creeping in to what these lay, lay teachers were, were offering. Um, and I thought about this, and one of the great benefits of the Sangha over the centuries has been how it has cared for and protected um, the Buddha Tamma. I mean, it's an amazing achievement, if you think about it, for 2,500 years to have preserved this teaching. Um, and I felt that it was, you know, that that needed to be uh, um, better understood. But I also felt, you know, I'm an Englishman, so I'm very keen on uh, to see Buddhism 
flourish here and, 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 and develop well. Um, when I first came back in 1977, there weren't many temples. We all knew each other and we used to get invited to each other's occasions. But as time has gone on, the number of temples has increased and we didn't know each other anymore. And I felt that was not good. I didn't like that really. Um, uh, and I felt that was, that weakened uh, the Sangha in this country. I know we have some differences of practice and tradition and all the rest of it, but still, you know, we are Buddhist monks. Uh, and I felt that that, that um, unity needed to be, to be honored. Um, and also from a practical point of view, we can support each other. Like, you know, this business over, over the um, uh, visas, when I went, when Lord Avebury organized the meeting for me with the minister, I was able to go into that meeting and say I was representing in that, at that time, 40 Buddhist temples. Well, when you're representing 40 temples, it's a greater impact than just one temple, one temple bringing up its MP or something like that they're not going to be that interested. Um, so together we have a strength uh, and, and, and we're able also, I hope, to help each other because I think that that's also an important thing that we should bear in mind, that uh, we should be caring for each, each other. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you to, um, thank you for your clarification. Uh, do you have any questions for Long Paul? Well, I think uh, the time very close now. Are we going to have a little bit or just... I think yeah, I, we, we can go on to half past. And the, the last issue that we would like to discuss is what the Western people are actually looking for from Buddhism. And if you have some question before we go to that point, you can raise the question. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question about the... At the moment, uh, we are as Long Paul organize the uh, TBS UK working for the Sangha in England, which is very important work that we are working together. Among that work, how can we help the young generation, especially in this country, to understand uh, Buddhism and how how the organization or how the temple uh, throughout the UK can put everything uh, in the same theme, same direction to help the children to understand or young generation to understand. Because now a lot of children uh, go to the temple and visit the temple. And in your opinion, because you are English and then you may know more than us how to put everything right for them. <laughs> well, I, I think, um... I think my first answer to that has to be that uh, monks need to be more proficient in English. Um, and, uh, and for more things in the temple to be conducted in English. Um, I think, you know, the, the traditions that, that youngsters will see when they come to the temple, that's fine. Um, but if they feel they can't understand, I mean, I have, occasionally I have, um, the children of Sri Lankan parents, uh, uh, for example, and sometimes it's been Burmese, but coming here. And, and those youngsters are living in England when they're outside of the home, but in Sri Lanka when they're back indoors. And, uh, and then they go occasionally to, and that's quite a tension, that's quite difficult. And then they, they go to, to a, a Sri Lankan temple and everything's in, in Sinhala, and they can't understand. And it becomes, it's just a nuisance, it becomes a nuisance for them having to go to these things. So I think, I think being able to communicate well is really very important. Um, and I, I would encourage, I, I, I'm well aware that, you know, we all like to speak our own language. When I was in Thailand, and as you know, I don't speak very good Thai really, I, I can get by. On a good day, I'm 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 reasonably fluent, but on a bad day, I'm not so good. <laughs> and uh, uh, but even so, you know, I I lived for months alone with Thai people in Isan, 
Um, and then I know when, when I was back with, with English speakers, it was a relief to just talk. So I know we like to speak our own language, but really, uh, if we're going to, if you want to really promote and your temple and Buddhism with the youngsters, then try and speak English as much as possible, because that uh, I think that's terribly important. Uh, may, may I add one point? Uh, because I have the experience uh, giving teaching to the school children, and oh, uh, I think oh, uh, uh, 5,000 school children from around London, nearby, and even from all the town come to visit the Buddha Patipa temple in order to learn Buddhism. And while I, I can see that here in the UK, we have a good opportunity to convey the teaching of the Buddha to the young children because they have RE, the religious education, they don't only study Buddhism, they don't only focus on Buddhism after um, visiting the Buddha Patipat Temple, and then they go to visit them the moors in, in, Mor in, in Morton. Well, to me, I think England gave us a good opportunity to convey the Buddhist teaching. We don't, we don't want to convert them, but we simply want to show Buddhism is, what Buddhism is about. Um, when I have the session with the um, school children, I try to keep them, them the, the teaching simple for them. I still remember, and one boy from Eden School asked me the question, what is an enlightenment? At that moment, I try to think about the answer. Well, I know how to answer, and if you are asked by the, the adults, but for the young boy, and who is only now 10 years old, and then I think, how can I give the good answer for his age? So I thought, well, perhaps imagine, and if you go into your room at night time, it's dark, and then you need to turn on the light. When the light is on, you see what is what. So that is how enlightenment occurs. I later on asked Pico Bordi and to check if my question is understandable for the youngster. He said, well, that's fine. Your, your semi is excellent. So in conclusion, I thought England gave us a good opportunity to convey the Buddhist teaching. So the young generation, the youngster, we learn more about Buddhism and later on, Later on, they will appreciate from, I thought for, for the past 20 or 10 years, when the monks go to the town, we never get teased or even joking. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. So perhaps, Jan, could you please share your experience with this? I, I, I remember you, you talk about this in your book, didn't you? Oh, well, yes, it, it's good. Uh, I believe when Long Pa, when you were in England at the time, and also one of the monks from Thailand, from Bangkok, he, he said to me when I was in England, and wherever I go, a lot of people teasing me badly. They say, skinhead, skinhead, you know? So, and I, he translated into Thai language, I huo nang, I huo nang. <laughs> so I said, that is the monk, he passed away now. I said, why? Because they not, like you they didn't like you at all behave like that for me personally from time to time experiencing like that but nowadays it's much much better and on small because you can see the children palm their hand respect you on the road and where so that's mean because they visit the temple in Wimbledon visit most of the temple everywhere I think that is experience that I, I learned from them I said say one word I don't call. It, 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 because this is the Buddhism is very really good in this country nowadays, it seems RE also introduced Buddhism to their practice. How, uh, and also we we, we quite uh, the, uh, fortunate that Buddhism is well accepted uh, to throughout the country. Uh, for those who are very young, how can we, we put ourselves to support and encourage them in the right 
direction in your opinion? Because I believe you also receive student as well at Temple. What you teach them at the, the basic, I let them know is the same as we teach here or not. We teach about the basic Buddhism, Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, Triple Gem, like the Buddha, and also five precepts, maybe eight of the four noble truth, eight four parts, and the way of life, a little bit. So, and part of meditation. Did you teach anything uh, more than that on what you reckon, uh, 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 suggest students to learn? I, uh, I do more or less the same. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't done much with children for a, a long time. I used to. Um, and of course, I do teach the, the, the students at the university. Uh, I know, I remember a long time ago that uh, we did a project with, with children. And, uh, you know, you have the Buddha image. And uh, we translate the, the word Buddha as, you know, one who, the one who knows. Okay, so then what does he know? And, uh, and we went on from there to talk about um, Anichang Dukang Anatta. And, uh, and uh, the children then did drawings and poems and stuff about uh, impermanence and suffering and, and so on. And, uh, and I remember one of, the, one of the teachers who was very keen um, when I went to his school, He'd also dared to teach his children, quite young, these were quite young, about rebirth. And uh, he got these kids to do uh, drawings and poems about other lives they might have lived, which is quite revolutionary, I thought, you know, because Christianity doesn't like that very much. But um, uh, so uh, all the little girls were, had written poems about uh, how they used to be butterflies and things. And, and the boys, you know, their childhood heroes like Sir Francis Drake and so on, were, they were, that was their previous lives. So it was quite fun, really. <laughs> right, Tana Jan saying that. Um, well, and did you have any questions for Lung Po? Thank you very much, Lung uh, Po, for, for the, you know, for all the uh, wisdom. Then, you know, maybe this is very last question. Um, what Buddhist teaching uh, should lay people in this country, especially, uh, apply in their uh, daily life to cope with their problems? Oh, God. Well, I, I mean, basic, basic teaching, practice meditation, develop mindfulness, but also practice good sila. I think the sila is, is actually very important. And when you practice sila, of course, you practice the rest because you have to be mindful and aware when you practice good sila. And you also, in, on many occasions, have to exercise your, your wisdom. So I, I think actually, I, 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 I teach, I, I emphasize the five precepts quite a bit. Um, the temptation you see, I mean, when I was young, we, uh, we were revolting against Christianity and and morality as it was taught because it seemed also negative you know and boring and pointless um, but I've learned that within Buddhism it's a different matter entirely and it becomes liberating and uh, the, the, the sila is also you know a source of wisdom because it's not always simple how you act uh, look for often you know, I have the, um, the questions from the lay disciple and who said well it's okay for me to keep the first to the fourth precept uh, but for the fifth one it's quite hard for me <laughs> yeah so what is your <laughs> suggestion for them well you have to just I mean you uh, uh, I find this disappointing really when people People are like this because it shows a kind of weakness, really, that, that's crept into our society. Um, a lack of kind of uh, moral fiber, almost, really, I think. Because you've got to be able to, you know, people will make things difficult. For, well, I, my own experience, 
I, I, was, I was an actor. Actors drink quite a lot. Yeah. And, uh, and I used to drink yeah. on occasions quite a bit. And any gatherings or parties, there would be alcohol. Um, and to begin with, I tried, I tried just sort of holding one glass because I didn't, I was a bit embarrassed about saying I didn't drink. Uh, and it was hopeless because they kept trying to fill it up. And uh, as eventually I, I just said, I don't drink. And people were fairly respecting of that. But there's one, I, I don't know, many people will know his name now, but at the time, the most famous actor in the world was Laurence Olivier, uh, Sir Laurence Olivier, and he was my boss. And uh, I had to go to a, his house one day for a party. And he used to make punch, his own punch. And we're all in there. And of course, he's ladling out the punch. And I have to say, I don't drink. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't take it too well, really. And uh, I managed to sort of escape. And then it happened again. Anyway, I stood up to him and I said, no, I don't drink. That's it. And uh, the next day, I was at the stage door and he came in with a casting director for a major TV company and immediately introduced me. So I had always felt that standing up to him and just standing up for my principles, um, you know, people respect that. And uh, I think that's what you have to do. You have to be able to do that. Right, thank you for your question. Um, well, we still, and have about maybe seven minutes and I would like you to tell us about and as a Western monk I think you understand the Western culture very well and better than, than three of us here so my my question is from your experience what are Western people looking for in Buddhism or from Buddhism and what is the best we could give to the Western practitioner or to the general Western people. Um, well, I mean, I'm I'm a bit old-fashioned, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, but for the most, I suspect, uh, and this was the case with me, that uh, a lot of people coming to Buddhism will have abandoned Christianity and will be quite disillusioned. Um, by what they've experienced, um, sometimes by the conduct of people within the Christian church, um, but also they've just kind of got, as I did, uh, kind of fed up with, with um, believing a dogma. And uh, so what was refreshing for me when I encountered Buddhism was that there wasn't the requirement to believe something and that uh, it was open to investigation. And that was very important to me. There was a kind of freedom to it um, and common sense. Uh, so I, I don't know what Western people now will be thinking, but I think that's, that will be, there will be something of that in it, that they will be leaving behind something that they are unhappy with and they're looking for something which is uh, reasonably logical and sensible and practical and that actually does make differences and of course meditation practice when you, as we all know it makes differences it changes people's people's minds um, and uh, and that's that's I'm pretty sure is what most people are looking for. They're, they're coming to Buddhism partly to get a bit of peace, uh, to bring some order and sense into their lives. Um, and I think in many cases also, although they may not recognize it, looking for something to look up to, an ideal which is, which is uh, sensible. Thank you. Thank you, Lumpur. And Tanajan Jakun Lao. Would you like to add something on this topic? Well, after many years uh, in this country, I learned from 
the English uh, society, and as Jean Paul say, most of the people they have the views and background more or less negative about their own background religions, and many of them have no uh, religions. We see at the moment we learn about 14 million uh, throughout the country from the last census that they said there is no religion. It may be a good opportunity for us to look at those who have no religion or no belief to put everything for the teaching of the Buddha as a lady, uh, their, their way of life. We said, I have no problem if they say Buddhism is not religion because that is very, very common word and then very easy to accept. And if they say Buddhism, not religion, uh, personally, I, I just say, well, if you are interested in uh, whatever the Buddha teaching or the way of life in Bud Bud uh, Buddhism that you can practice the Dhamma, that is the main, that is the, 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 the important part or the aim to overcome the suffering or to gain some happiness in your life. It's not because of you have the brand of religion and you're not happy or you have whatever religion that you belong to, but if you don't use the teaching in, in uh, religion to practice in daily life, but you deal with suffering, so it's not very good. So if you have no religion at all, but you are a happy person, wherever you go, you have no problem with the people yourself and the other. This is my suggestion uh, to the people when I ca uh, came across to the people like that. So, so really, Lung Pho, because you are English and you've been so many, many years in Buddhism, and at the moment you can see many, many uh, 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 the people who practice Buddhism throughout the country, including the temple now. There are many, many temples now. And in the future, hopefully, um, the people can uh, practice more Buddhist and recognize Buddhism in uh, worldwide and that we can do something for the people. That is my, my, my hope. Because after you've been here for many years, and I've been here many years, and new young generation come along, I can see the changing from, from the day one up to now, quite different and quite positive. And wherever I go along the road, the very high percentage of the people give very high credit and respect to the Buddhist monks, unlike before. So, in the two, three decades, I must say the work that you have done, I work the Buddhist monk here, and from the own generation, from the first part of the our master, Long Pao Shodok and Long Pao Cha, up to now, we are maybe quite about different three or four decades now. That's very, very good at the work that we are doing. And I will really appreciate that you are as an English monk and share with Thai tradition and know more in two sides. And thank you very much for, for your knowledge and then you give us opportunity to know more about yourself. And thank you, Mahasakon, for being yeah, very thank, yeah, thank, you. thank you, Thanat Jan Lao. I would like to invite Thanat Sena to say a few words before I invite Lung Ho to, um, to conclude and his discussion. Thanat Sena, do you have anything to add on? Thank you very much, uh, Tanajan from Asad Pasakon. And yes, I want to add a little bit to, to the, you know, what Western people look, are looking for, you know, um, from Buddhism, you know, as we have, if, if we look at, um, you know, a people origin, you know, from what we uh, experience, you know, so as we, if, if we look at a suffering, every, everyone has suffering. Even you are rich, even in a developed country, we can say, you know, this is developed, high, far developed country. You have everything, you have, you know, many things that um, can satisfy you, but people still, you know, have uh, suffering or uh, depressed or, you know, anxiety, agitations or whatever, you know, that uh, emotional feeling. But, you know, the, what they're looking for, from Buddhism is that because Buddhism has a good thing about, you know, how to deal with those emotional, you know, those, those emotion, 
then, uh, you know, as Ron Paul mentioned that, you know, samadhi or meditation is the best way to, you know, uh, to, uh, to deal with or to cope with our emotion in this way. So one of the important thing is meditation. And that's why now meditation is introduced to many different places in school, in, uh, in government, uh, plays and in other, you know, in office, you know, we, we can see this, this is very popular now, especially meditation. So Buddhist meditation is, you know, is the, is the one that, uh, you know, people are looking for from, uh, from, from Buddhism here. And now, you know, in, in school, you know, they, uh, you know, Buddhist meditation and Buddhism are you know, it's a thought to the, it's to the student. So I think, you know, this, this is what they are looking for. Um, yeah, from, from uh, the, uh, from Buddhism. Thank, thank you, Tan, Tan Ajahn Sena. Well, Long Po, we now and confident over uh, to the discussion. I just would like to invite you to give the concluding remarks in, uh, from what we have discussed and then what what is your suggestion for the lay people not only lay people for general general people during the situation of pandemic and that would be the concluding remark um well well i i I'm, thank you very much for for inviting me to to take part in this it's been a very interesting time and i i hope what has been said will have been of some use to people tuning in. Um, regarding the pandemic, well, it's another aspect of the unsatisfactory nature of our existence. So it's, it's really being a very good teacher to us, reminding us that uh, our lives are very uncertain. And really, we... Uh, we uh, walk a tightrope through life. Um, and I hope really that, that, uh, that people will come out of it much wiser, uh, not taking things so much for granted as they have been. That's the trouble with prosperity, you see, that people take it for granted. Uh, and we shouldn't take things for granted because everything is changing and uh, the conditions that support us change. And, and uh, so that's, that's the nature of our existence. Uh, so I'm hoping that um, the pandemic will be a good, it will wake people up to the reality of our existence. Um, to deal with it, we have to be patient and we have to try to to practice um, Ganti Parami. There's no parami, the perfection of patient. Patient endurance. There's no other way out of it. Yeah, thank you to Long Paul Kimatamo or Pa Pao Navite. And now I would like to invite Anajan Jakun Lao to uh, say thank you on behalf of the Council of Thai Buddhist Mink and also on behalf of the Theravada Buddhist Sangha in the UK. And we are now in the cooperation between the Theravada Buddhist Sangha in the UK and the Council of Thai Buddhism and all affiliated Buddhist temple in the UK. Thank you again, Nopo, for your time. And this is on behalf of the Council of the Thai uh, Buddhist Monk in UK and the chair uh, on behalf of Long Po, Te Pavana Mongkon, who's appreciate that you the work that you have done and the work that we are doing together now and for the benefits of the people in this country and to the world in the future or we are doing now and may all of us be safe and pro uh, protected and may all the people also protected and uh, thank you very much Long Paul. thank you very much indeed yeah, thank you to Tan Senat, thank you to Long Paul and Tan Ajahn Lao, yeah. and thank you to all the audience and may you all be blessed and with happiness, well-being, success, good health by the Trippin' Gem. Thank you.
Thank you. May all beings be well and happy. Thanks. Ah, do. Ah, do.